Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to the World Energy Congress plenary session on clean energy without borders. I'm Tim Richards and I'll be moderating this distinguished panel today. And for the last several years, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to chair a World Energy Council group that's been looking at issues related to international trade and investment in energy products, energy services, and projects in the energy sector. Our subject matter today, over the next 90 minutes, will be uh, fundamental to the work of the WEC. How can we make it easier to achieve widespread international distribution of clean energy technology to create, to create healthier environments, fight climate change, and bring the benefits of electricity and primary energy to the billions of people who don't enjoy those services and advantages today. Throughout this Congress, we've heard many stories of progress that's been made in all of these areas. And that's incredibly important. And at the same time, the trilemma challenges remain very real and more needs to be done to meet those challenges. One of the most important areas where additional progress can be made is by bringing the international community more closely together to make sure that the best clean energy products and services and funds can flow to the places in the world where they're most needed. And achieving this goal is going to take creativity and it's going to take concerted efforts to break down barriers. There are many aspects to this question of how to achieve clean energy without borders. And we're fortunate to have an outstanding panel with us this afternoon to share their thoughts and vision on that subject from a variety of perspectives. I'll introduce each of our panelists um, and they will then give an overview of four to five minutes followed by a conversation amongst us and then at toward the end we will open it up for questions from all of you so I would encourage you as we go forward think of those things that you'd like to ask this panel about during our question and answer period. Let me now introduce our distinguished panelists. First to my immediate left is Christiana Figueres. Christiana is the executive secretary of the UN Climate Change Secretariat and she has a long and distinguished career in climate change and sustainability. She's made important contributions to the literature and the design of climate solutions, and she's worked in a variety of roles, both in the Costa Rican government and with NGOs, and has been a frequent advisor to the private sector. To her left is Jim Rogers. Jim Rogers has served as chairman, president, and CEO of Duke Energy since 2007. Mr. Rogers has served more than 50 cumulative years on the boards of directors of eight Fortune 500 companies, and he served on numerous nonprofit boards, currently including the boards of the Asia Society and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. In 2012, he assumed the chairmanship of the Global Sustainable Electricity Partnership, a nonprofit organization composed of the world's leading electric utilities. To Mr. Rogers' left is Kande K. Yomkela. Kande is Special Representative of the UN Secretary General and Chief Executive for the Sustainable Energy for All Initiative. He has served as a minister in the government of Sierra Leone and in a variety of, of roles within the United Nations. As Special Representative, Mr. Yomkela will seek to mobilize action toward a sustainable energy future and accelerate the implementation of the Secretary General's initiative, as well as engaging with the leadership of relevant stakeholders in government, business, academia, and civil society at the highest level to advocate for and promote sustainable energy for all. And finally, on the far left is Ricardo Melendez Ortiz. Mr. Melendez is the co-founder and the Chief Executive Officer of the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development. Based in Geneva, he's held that role since 1996. In the course of his distinguished career, he has served as a representative of the government of Colombia in a wide range of international negotiations, including those on trade and on climate. 
He is a co-convener of the Sustainable Energy Trade Initiative, which is a public-private partnership focused on harnessing the forces of trade for building up the low-carbon economy. And he's on the World Economic Forum's Global, Global Agenda Council on trade and on new energy architecture. He's also on the board of numerous other organizations and initiatives related to trade and sustainable development. Please join me in welcoming our panel, and then we will begin with Christiana. So we will go in the following order. We will ask, uh, first Christiana will speak, then Ricardo, then Conde, and finally Jim. We'll go in that order. And three or four minutes from each of our panelists, and then we'll turn to a conversation. Christiana. Thanks very much and good afternoon to all of you. Um, since I have the pleasure of starting this, um, I would like to take the big picture view. Um, I love the title of this uh, conversation because uh, clean energy without borders, from my perspective, uh, means two things. It means, first of all, that the solution to be able to deploy the necessary clean energies around the world cannot be bound within either the international process or in fact even with, within the sum total of the national processes. So the without borders in that sense signifies that it is absolutely critical and that is one of the lessons learn, learned that we have over the past three or four years in the climate change process at the international level that you need both efforts. You need both the top-down effort that is currently being undertaken by governments to come to a global universal climate agreement that will be applicable to all countries in differentiated manner, but that will house all countries. But you also need that to be buttressed by the national and local efforts that are currently already underway. And we know that it is not going to be possible to have a universal agreement unless there is a critical mass of, of, of efforts, of legislation, of regulations at the national and even the subnational level that actually are vertically integrated such that they will be able to support the international agreement. So without borders in that sense means you need both the international effort as well as the national and the local efforts to work with each other. The other sense in which I like uh, the title Without Borders is um, that there is no way that policy can work without the input of technology finance on the ground and vice versa. There is no way that the public sector can move forward with policies without being informed in the reality, about the reality of the challenges that we face, and there's certainly no way that the private sector can move forward without being supported by the regulatory framework. So the impasse that we seem to have right now of the you first syndrome, where a lot of the business sector, present company excluded, is saying, well, to the policy, well, we need policy perfection and otherwise we can't move in, it's too risky. And the, the, um, the policy side saying, well, but ensure us, please, that we're still going to be competitive because we don't want to lose competition to our neighbors on the left and on the right. That impasse needs to be overcome. Um, and in that sense, the border or the boundary between the private and the public also needs to come down so that it has to be a collaborative effort. That as a general context in which then my panel members will give you actually much more concrete examples of how that is already being done. W wonderful start and thank you so much for that framing of the issue and the, the expansion of how we think about the term without borders. So thank you so much, Christiana. Let's turn next to Ricardo and uh, ask for his perspectives. Thank you very much. Uh, Team, I'm really very happy to be here. I'm always happy to be in Korea, um, but I'm also very happy to be at the, at the World Energy Council talking about these issues. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with the work that you have done at the, at the World uh, Energy uh, Council, particularly to strengthen markets for clean energy technologies. I think just building uh, briefly on what Christiana just said, we have to understand that we live in a globalized world. If we are going to increase through a rapid scale-up and a massive scale-up 
the use of renewable energy technologies and energy efficient goods with the purpose of addressing mitigation for climate change, access to energy for those that don't have access to energy, and providing more security in energy supply, we will need to make an effort to understand how that work really works in practice and then ensure that regulatory frameworks and policies enable that build up. In very simple terms, when we talk about renewable energy technologies, we're talking about the goods and services and not the fuels that cross the borders. And when we talk about those goods and services, we're talking about a great number of components, but also intermediate goods and tasks that are now performing the global economy. The global economy of today, usually a project for renewable energy, for instance, would be put together by uh, an aggregation of transactions where many actors are involved in different jurisdictions. And these actors engage in contracts or transactions that include trade in goods and services, investment, intellectual property, in order to be able to put together the final uh, piece that we need to deliver the renewable energy. So R&D for innovation, for instance, happens in one country, say in the US, for PV solar. The, the manufacturing of machines so that the, the panels can be produced usually takes place in Europe or the US as well, or, or in other countries like Korea and Japan. But the manufacturing itself of, of the PV solar panels take place then in China or other countries. The exchange between man, many jurisdictions is what makes possible that the prices of PV solar have now gone down to the level, levels that we have, that the investment in these renewable energy technologies have gone up to the levels that they have gone, and that we now can have competitive energy technologies that could then make a dent in uh, climate change mitigation and provide solutions of distributed energy to those that don't have access to it. A simple good like, for instance, a wind um, mill doesn't cross a border as one piece. It crosses the border, several, several borders, as 157 components. And the services that are involved in installing it and then maintaining it and, and operating that good at the local level, at the domestic level, uh, provides more jobs than the manufacturing itself. So understanding those very basic uh, issues is terribly important to try to understand then and act on the, the right and the adequate regulatory frameworks that will deliver the solutions that we need. As it is today, we have a world that is made up of too many barriers, from very simple tariffs the, at the border to non-tariff barriers such as the standards, cumbersome, and, and very heterogeneous in different countries to policies like subsidies or energy or industrial policies or even fiscal that affect the competitiveness of various countries to participate in the value chains and the, and the international production networks that would generate these goods. There are some efforts in place. For instance, recently, two years ago and then a year ago, first in Honolulu and then in Vladivostok, the countries that are main members of APEC uh, 21 countries decided to lower their tariffs, apply tariffs, to all goods, environmental goods and services, below 5%. They have finally agreed to 54 of these goods. That's not yet good, it's just about 19 uh, of those goods that relate to renewable energy technologies. But that's already a $600 billion market, and it's already important to try to move some of these technologies forward. That's a good effort, but it's not yet where we want to go. We want to go to somewhere around 154 goods and do it at the multilateral level in binding and secure terms. But I can build up on this as we go into the discussion in the panel. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, and I think there will be a lot to react to in that. And um, let's ask next for Conde to provide his perspective and bring the sustainability aspect into it as well. Thank you very much. The way we see energy without borders in the United Nations, I see three dimensions. One, first of all, 
when the Millennium Development Goals were declared, we observed in the implementation that they were all treated in silos. We are convinced today that we cannot achieve those Millennium Development Goals or sustain new Sustainable Development Goals without having energy as the core. The Secretary General describes energy as the golden thread that runs through all the pillars of sustainable development. So one border is to break down these silos and understand that without access to energy, you can't run the hospitals, you can't build up the educational systems well, you can't ensure women's economic empowerment. Women and girls spend about 20 hours a week collecting firewood and water. So can we break down the borders in terms of public, uh, public policy for the environment minister to talk with the energy minister, the mines minister, in their mining policies to talk to the energy minister as well, or the finance minister and the energy minister. Second dimension. We are convinced also that you need regional cooperation. I have spent all today really just going to the finance sessions. And I hear a lot of those who control the finance talk about the size of projects. Scale is important. Otherwise, the, the investment is not interesting because of the risks involved. In some of the poorer countries where energy access is worse, Mali, Burkina Faso, Sierra Leone, the projects are too tiny to have any interest, but a regional approach would make those projects probably more attractive. So breaking borders so that these countries begin to look at energy trade, common transmission backbones, to, to be able to attract bigger investments to come that will benefit the region and therefore provide greater access to energy. Third, we believe that as you deal with access, you must deal with efficiency and renewables. That's why in the initiative, we push for a goal, universal access to energy by 2030, we push for doubling the annual rate of improvement of energy efficiency by 2030 and doubling the share of renewables by 2030. Three targets all combined to push universal access to energy, but at the same time address climate change. The last two targets, for example, are to deal with emissions. That's another border, making energy approaches inclusive in dealing with all three, access, efficiency, renewables. The last one is what Ricardo said. And this is my plea to the Africans. The Asians were able to ride different economic waves. Labor-intensive manufacture, the Asians moved fast. They lifted millions of their people out of poverty. Digital revolution, the Asians joined. So yes, today in Asia, you have a lot of call centers. The Asians joined that wave. Now the Asians, APEC and others, decided to lower tariffs on green goods and environmental services. My plea to the Africans is do the same. It is not acceptable that for Mali and some other very poor African countries, they are putting 20-30% duty on renewable energy, solar panels. We want the families to get these cheap solar panels, but by the time you slap duty on it, it's not available to the poor to have decentralized off-grid solutions. So part of breaking the borders is, can the other energy poor regions look at the reforms that are taking place in Asia and Latin America that is enabling their people to have access to massive investments and also access to energy. This is not impossible because we did the same for digital revolution in Africa. In 2000, we had less than 10 million mobile connections in Africa. 2012, 720 million mobile connections. How did it work? Stable public policies, deregulation, incentives. No subsidies, and our people are paying cash for mobile telephony. 720 million connections within a decade. So my point is, can we do for the energy sector what we did for the mobile sector? Define the right public policies, make them transparent and stable, and let private capital flow in scales that we need to make sure that we don't do what I heard yesterday. I heard yesterday in one of the panels that as business as usual, it will take us 60 to 70 years to have universal access to energy. I'm convinced we can do it within two decades because Jim Rogers and others have the technologies and you in the audience, you the energy people, you know the technologies. How do we bring business, public policy, and partnerships to align and the right pricing to make sure that in fact we get universal access by 2030, but also we lower emissions to stay within two degrees by 2030. I'm convinced we can do all. Wonderful. Uh, Kande, thank you very much. Um, a, a, a wonderful summary of the perspective of how you bring all of these different aspects of 
of Clean Energy Without Borders together. And to uh, complete our first round of, of key comments, let's turn to Jim Rogers. And uh, Jim, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here with you all this afternoon and talking about this important subject. Think about it. Access to electricity has a catalytic impact on economic development. It enables a modern society. And as a business guy, I approach this as you would approach any problem. First is to define it. There's 1.2 billion people that don't have any access. The question is, where are they? Are they in remote areas? Are they in suburban areas? As you develop a plan, you need to develop around the specific areas. There's almost 3 billion people in the world that are underserved by electricity. And the question is, how do you improve their access to electricity in a cost-effective way? I believe that as you define the problem, you have to focus really on two things. One is how do you aggregate the financial support? And I'll talk more in a few moments about how you do it. We need to look at different financing models. We need to look at a combination of public support, private support to make this happen. The second thing is you have to aggregate projects. And I think that is very important. I heard a great thoughtful conversation by C.P. Jane this morning on how to prioritize uh, projects in an area and what the characteristics, how to engage the people it, with respect to a project, because that is the most important thing on the ground, is have ownership. And an idea that has evolved is the idea of creating cooperatives, so the people in a village or a community or a region own, at the end of the day, their power system. So there is much work to do to be able to bring the resources together to make it happen. I think it has to happen in a way, and let me just mention from the aggregation of resources, clearly President Obama with Power Africa has put a stake in the ground with respect to certain countries in Africa where he wants to make this happen. USAID has been empowered to try to make it happen. Other organizations can make it happen. But the ability to take charitable contributions, 501c3 we call them in the U.S., coupled with <coughs> USAID funds, other public funds, and add to that what I call impact investment. It's a whole new category of investment that's evolving around the world. It's the same people that, and same foundations that historically have made charitable contributions, but think they can make a greater impact if they can effectively loan the money to the project, get a return on it more like a bond, and at the end of the day, get recovery of that investment. So I see a way to bring together these different sources of funding to be able to make this a reality. It will be transformative. It will take an incredible amount of work. It will take focus. But it's not different than any other business problem that we have faced, not different than any other problem that's faced society. I have confidence in the people. I have confidence in our ability to mobilize. And you say, well, Rogers, why do you have confidence? It hadn't happened yet. Why will it happen now? And I think that not only is the UN behind it, but organizations around the world are behind it. And I think there are people, individuals, that are prepared to step up and make this a reality now, 
plus we have technologies where the price are more competitive. As solar prices come down, as wind turbine prices come down, the emergence of battery technology. We have the technology, we can get the money, and we can find a system to systematically make this a reality for the people of the world with no access. Thank you all very much. Jim, thank you very much for those uh, great comments from the point of view of a businessman who's actually going to make this his mission. And it's, it's really deeply moving and encouraging. Um, so I'd like to take now a few elements of things that each of you have referenced that are all part of creating this world of clean energy without borders and go into them a little bit more deeply. And let's start with, with, with what Ricardo talked about, the component of reducing trade barriers in a way to get, and, and, and Conde talked about this as well, reducing trade barriers in a, as a way to help reduce the cost of making cleaner energy projects possible. And if, why don't we just go straight down the row uh, this time, and so that'll give Ricardo the chance to, uh, to comment upon everyone else's comments. And we'll start with you, Christiana. Uh, well, b before I answer that, I just want to say, Jim, thank you very much for your commitment. And can we clone you? <laughs> because you should not be the exception to the rule, right? You should be the norm. Uh, you, should, you should really have so many colleagues in the energy industry and in the sector who have your same commitment and your same vision and who share your, uh, your positive approach that we can do this. Because I tell you what, we don't have another option. We've just got to be able to solve this problem. We cannot afford not to do so. So whenever I'm going to work on cloning, while well, you work on the energy solution, and then I'm going to clone you. Um, taxes, um, you know, there really is a, um, a, a serious discrepancy in the access to technology and the access to finance that developing countries have versus developed countries have for clean technologies in the energy sector, but also in many other things. And if um, barriers at the borders, if fiscal barriers at the borders are added to that, it just really triplifies the problem of access. So if those, um, if those barriers can be removed or lessened, if on top of that you get the price coming down, as we have seen, the price for solar coming down 80% since 2008 and wind hopefully um, came coming up to that, and if there is a very concerted effort, which is currently underway, incipient, not yet there enough, but uh, a concerted effort to get these technologies, the pertinent technologies, to the populations that need them, then we may be underway. We have to understand that not all solutions are going to be appropriate for every kind of situation. Every situation needs its very particular solutions, both technology-wise, financial package-wise, um, and, and also instrumentation-wise. So the complexity here is how do you find the appropriate set and context of the solutions for the job at hand. But having Fiscal barriers at the borders does not help to, help to um, accelerate the solution. And if, uh, if I can jump on the bandwagon there with Kamde, uh, the example being set by Asia should be followed not only by Africa, but by Latin America too. Uh, and it is in fact all developing countries' interest to really bring down those barriers as soon as possible. Today, I'm in the power business in the U.S. and in Latin America. And one of the part of my job is to build strong relationships at the federal level. And actually in the U.S., I consider the state governments is almost like separate. Each state is like a separate country in a way. And so you have to build strong relationships at, at the federal government level, but you have to build strong relationships at the local level and you've got to build a consensus about what's the, the best way forward, how to do it in the most economic way. And quite frankly, you have to create a competition among the developing countries to see if they want to compete, to see if they really want access. 
And if they really want access, they will bring the barriers down. And that will be a test of where you invest. And if they know that it's a test, if they know that their ability to create the right environment, to create the right incentives, to be in the country, investment will follow. The development of projects will happen. But it also requires, and this is a trickier issue, having a strong relationship and strong support from the state-owned utilities. Because if they don't support this, this will not succeed. And clearly, in working and improving the underserved in those systems is important. But equally important is the people that are in remote areas that probably will not, under the current plans of state utilities, will not have electricity for maybe one or two decades, if then. So the local utility needs to be supportive along with the government and any barriers, putting a tax on solar lanterns. I mean, I've dealt with that issue before. If you build a microgrid, tax on the bringing in solar panels, all these things are impediments. And so I think there needs to be clarity around how do you create an environment to attract investment to solve the problem within the country? And let me just end on this kind of point. I admire what China has done. No country in the history of the world has lifted more people from poverty in a shorter period of time. Almost 400 million people. And the key to them lifting them from poverty and moving them toward the middle class was simply, first step, access to electricity. That's foundational. Now, the problem is they did a great job of doing it, but it translated into significant emissions of CO2. We almost have the same number of people that need access today around the world as the Chinese population, so we need to do the same thing, but we cannot have the same CO2 footprint when we achieve this goal. Some of you... Some of you might remember the book by Paul Collier, The Bottom Billion. In 2006, when I was at UNIDO, I invited Paul to do a study for us, uh, the Industrial Development Report. And we argued in that report that what has helped Asia lift so many people out of poverty, including those in China, is their move towards higher value manufactured products, and some of them labor intensive products. For me, if you look at what has happened also with renewable energy uh, uh, demand in the last two years, the REN21 report shows that in 2012, you had almost $250 billion in investment in renewable energy. Over 50% of that was in developing countries. The developing countries, when things slow down in America and in Europe, developing countries now see renewable energy that they can leapfrog, that in fact they can bring off-grid solutions to their communities faster without having to invest in moving the grid. So my point is what? If this market is beginning to shift to developing countries, can we do what Ricardo mentioned? Let's look at the components within these technologies. He mentioned that wind, maybe it's 157 or 54 different uh, components. This is a job creation opportunity in these countries. Let us give the jobs argument as well, that in fact they can be trained to produce these components. Cavalio confirmed that today, this morning for Brazil. Brazil is beginning to export wind technology. But also Cavalio showed that in fact in Brazil and in other developing countries, some of these technologies are very competitive with other technologies. Maybe they don't need subsidies in some regions because of the peculiarity of their geography or their circumstances. So my point here is, yes, trade matters uh, as we look at market expansion and also the possibility of creating green jobs in these countries. The same applies for even energy-efficient bulbs. They're beginning to manufacture them now in Lesotho. We didn't expect that. Philips has a factory making those bulbs, but why? Because it's for the 
Saku region. It's for the customs union. That's a bigger market. And so they're beginning to create green jobs and at the same time reducing energy demand. Excellent. And let's ask Ricardo now. You've heard other people's perspectives and you have the idea that maybe not only ECOWAS but Latin America should follow the APEC model. Um, share, share further thoughts with us, please. Uh, thank you, Jim. Well, mo most of what I'm hearing here is, uh, is really music to my ears. I've spent uh, the past uh, five years or so looking into these issues very deeply. And it has been difficult to get people to really appreciate um, how much we need to get things right. So you asked before how uh, governments should work with business and with others in making sure that, that we get that, that right type of policies. The, um, the interesting thing is that I, I was just thinking while I'm listening to, to the views by my colleagues that if a Martian were to land here today, he, he would find this absolutely folly, absolutely crazy. We have not only different communities working against each other, we have policies that work against each other uh, inside countries, uh, as Jim put it, but also across borders. And what we need is for both the different communities to, to get now into the same direction um, on policy matters, the trade policy community with the energy, with the climate change. They need to sit together and understand where the intersection brings this to an imperative and to urgency. And we need the policies also to be coordinated in the same direction. So, for instance, you're asking about what is happening in Latin America. When, you, when we look at the, at the tariff profiles of Latin American countries, yes, the Latin American countries have done quite a, a good job in introducing some of these renewable energy technologies and investments, but their tariff profiles do not reflect that yet. Uh, they have been designed in such a way that, say, for a wind um, a project, wind energy project, or a PV solar project, you still have very variable tariffs for the components uh, within the equipment that is needed, uh, which means that the inefficiencies in putting together a value chain to provide that equipment to that location are just going to be multiplied, as Christiana was saying before. What we need is to make sure that there is a coherent approach that governments understand that instead of talking, for instance, about environmental goods and services or green trade, they should be talking about climate-friendly goods and services, say. Come up with the list of those, um, again, the, the goods, services, all the components that are necessary to put together these projects and address this in a coherent manner. Then look not only at, um, at the border policies, but look at other policies and look not only at trade policies, but again, look at fiscal, uh, look at energy policies as well. Sometimes energy policies are working against uh, this type of, of, uh, of purposes. We have, for instance, in the past two, three years, a proliferation of uh, local content requirements, which are a condition to use locally produced goods um, in f for a, uh, a renewable energy project. Because of the nature of the global economy, again, it is undoubtedly that any solar or wind or geothermal project today will use local content requirements. But making this mandatory in an arbitrary ma manner, say 60% of a wind uh, energy equipment would be required to be sourced locally, just makes things so more expensive and complicated that you're really shooting yourself in, a, in your foot. Uh, so those are policies that are not good from an energy perspective, and they have also proven to be not good from an industrial policy perspective. And, and this is something that is important, I guess, uh, again, as, as uh, Candy was saying before. We want countries to generate jobs, but you need to understand where the jobs are. We have been looking closely at this as well. And most of the jobs in renewable energies are in the services sector. Also, most of the best paying jobs in renewable energies are in the services sector. They're in the operation, in the installation, in the maintenance of the equipment in the, in the energy sector. Now, what can be, what can be done in, in terms of regulatory frameworks? <clears throat> There's much um, opportunity right now, and I think it's, we're 
actually at the right moment to make a big push for it, to try to bring heads together, particularly in the trade policy community, to understand these issues. Uh, President Obama, in his in climate action plan that he um, pronounced before the summer, dedicated a couple of paragraphs to these specific issues. And he mandated the, the USTR to go back to the table and get the negotiations moving. But we need more ambition. We need both breadth and depth given to these uh, trade negotiations. And then we need the specificity for climate-friendly goods and services. And that's something that can be done, uh, I wouldn't say easily, but could be done if there is the political will to put this together. If we bring the same message to the climate fora, to the energy for forums like this, and to the trade forums like the WTO, but also the regional uh, trade initiatives, we can actually move forward. I'll give you just to close there the, this um, uh, quick example. In 2011 and 2012, we worked with the European Union to get a directive, which is now in place, that mandates that the European Union now negotiates provisions to liberalize renewable energy technologies in their bilateral and regional trade agreements, and they're doing so. So there's a new generation coming up, already the EU-Singapore agreement brings this type of provisions. We're hoping that the US-led uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, as well as probably the Transatlantic uh, Trade and Investment Partnership between the US and the EU, will also make some inroads in the same direction. So there is a good opportunity, but we need a clear message and the political will to move in that direction. Can I ask my fellow panelists a question? There's one question for Jim and one shared question for the two of you. Um, Jim, you have made a very clear case for um, enabling environment, and you have said if a country puts together its enabling environment, investment will follow. I believe you, and I'm assuming at least 95% of this audience believes you. But I put myself in the shoes of most developing countries who argue the fact is that it is a handful of countries who have been the recipients of 90% of foreign direct investment. So those countries, that handful of countries, would probably say, well, we know, yes, we've put the enabling environment in place and we've received the investment. What happens to the other countries? Honestly, what I hear from developing countries day in and day out is they do not have the confidence that the private sector, that the investment, that the market, the capital markets will follow the if they do put in their, um, their enabling environment. They actually have more confidence, believe it or not, in public sector funding, and they would like governments from the industrialized nations to make commitments of where that ODA funding plus the climate finance is going to come from, because they have more confidence, fully well knowing that the levels of that public sector financing is way below the private sector, but they still have more confidence. They do not have confidence that the private sector financing is going to come uh, if they put the enabling environments in place. So how would you answer that? And then I have an equally challenging question for the two of you. <laughs> okay, I'm ready to roll. Uh, great question, actually. It's a tough question. I, I would answer it a couple ways. I think it's incumbent on business to demonstrate to the country that they can and will bring the effort, bring the resources to make it happen. Because it's a question of belief. The other part of the argument is, look at the debt and deficit of the United States. Look at the debt situation of Western Europe and other developed countries. They don't have the same capability today as they even had 10 years ago to be able to do traditional aid in developing countries. So the answer really is, is to embrace an approach that works. Um, and, to, and, and, and it maybe takes a little act of faith because maybe they should simply say, let's experiment. Let's go to a region of our country and let's say I'm knocking on the door and they say, Rogers, go there, demonstrate 
you can do a project, show us how you can replicate it, and then demonstrate how you can scale it. And quite frankly, in a developing world, to bring a project where it might be a cooperative, where the people actually own the system, might be very convincing in some countries, maybe not in others. And it may not be the best model. So the bottom line is, is that you have to start, you have to demonstrate it, and that's the way it is in business. And I'd give one other point that I think is really important. You go, Rogers, you need to be cloned. Well, I can make the business case about why other CEOs and other companies should be doing it. If you think about building microgrids and using solar and emerging battery technologies, there is a terrific opportunity to learn, and people coin the phrase reverse innovation. As you do this on a blank sheet of paper in remote areas around the world, you're learning how to do it in the developed world. Because the number one problem companies like ours face in the developed world is cyber attacks, terrorist attacks, and storm restoration, and building microgrids and having solar and battery blended in is a key to the how we, we will redesign our systems in the future. So from a selfish perspective, I see great learnings coming from this. At the same time, I see people getting access to electricity in the process. Putting my other question out, which actually has to do with the relationship between developed and developing countries, um, because I, I find myself thinking myself into the shoes of developing countries. Um, and here's what they say. They say, yeah, 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 I, and I do the same case, okay? I always say, you know, in these kinds of fora, yeah, we have to follow the same thing that we're doing with mobile phones, we have to follow it with electricity. Okay, but now let me push back the way, you know, I hear developing countries push back and go, well, wait a minute, you're expecting us to make a huge transformation here in our development model out of an act of faith, I hear Jim Rogers say, show me one country that has done it. This is the problem. We don't have a particular country, one country, either in the north or in the south. I mean, if you take out, I don't know, Germany that is on its way but having difficulties, you maybe you can point to Iceland, okay? But there are very, very few countries with very specific conditions, and how many of those conditions are replicable by developing countries? So we're asking them to do something that they have to do, that they have no other options, that we are creating the global and the national and the financial and the technical environment for them to do, but there's no model that we can point to. So here we are asking them to take not only an act of faith, a leap of faith. Kande and... <laughs> How do you explain? In, how, in how sustainable do you energy them? for all, we put all technologies on the table. Our philosophy is that we give information, we build capacity, the country determines its energy mix. We don't believe, we don't believe, and I fully agree with you, that we should sell false hope to countries. They will determine their energy mix based on their resource endowments and capabilities and at a pace that they can go. However, we also believe that the developing countries must prioritize energy as they're prioritizing other sectors. i give you an example. Uh, two years ago, I was with a donor, and he's, uh, the minister said to me, do you know that from A, B, C, D countries, none of them prioritize energy? He said, I was surprised. And I know they lack energy, their penetration rate or access rate is 23%. My reply to that was, we have taught them for 15 years that energy was not part of poverty reduction. That's the narrative we want to change now. And in one of the sessions this afternoon, I was very happy to see the multilateral development bank saying, energy is the core part of poverty reduction. Energy is the core part of dealing with the Millennium Development Goals. So my message to uh, developing countries is, Look at your energy matrix. Renewables has to be part of that matrix. Africans must invest in hydropower. They must look at bioenergy as well. But at the same time, they should look at other countries where 
not too far, even in Africa, in Morocco, where they're investing systematically in providing, for example, solar panels in mountain regions so that they have access because they know they will not bring the greed, but they almost have 98% electrification rate. So these are the workable models Africans should look at. And when we say hydro, it doesn't mean a big hydro dam. It can be 500 kilowatts. That's what the Chinese did. In every village for the village enterprises, they had an energy source as small as 550 kilowatts or one megawatt. The community managed, the community pays. Why? You need that energy to process the food. You need that energy to pump the water. You need that energy to store the food so you take it to market, which means energy at a quantum that lifts productivity in the community. So my message is, yeah, we can't oversell the greening of energy systems to poor countries when we know others are not doing it, even those who have the wherewithal. I fully agree with you if that's the notion. You know, I'd add one other thing. I mean, in making the argument, is that there's never been a time in history that the technology is available as it is today. And that is really a critical point. And, and with the emergence of these technologies, we can do things we never thought we could do before. The second thing I would say is, and this is in the process of making it happen, I look across the developing world, there are many groups attempting to do a variety of efforts to bring electricity to remote areas. But they haven't been brought together and there isn't a concerted effort. And so I, th I think the ability to mobilize and organize and focus that group is really important in having an impact. The other thing, to really make Condi's point another way, is there's a lot of efforts on refrigeration or water, name it, but it's done in a silo. It's not done horizontally. And that is a remnant of an aid mentality. We can fix water, we can fix health, we can fix HIV, not knowing that you really have to build an infrastructure on a foundation of electric access. And that is what's different and needs to be told. Good. Let me, let me follow up on, on some of the things that you've said, Jim, and I think get the other panelists' point of view on this. So um, you made the point, and I think everybody agrees, that the developed world is unlikely to be able to undertake a pure aid program of the magnitude that would be required to address the, uh, the needs of developing countries, especially in clean energy. So how do you put together a new, a new paradigm, a new model of what it takes to bring investment into developing countries and have it be repetitive. And I'll comment on this, just one comment about the cloning idea. In fact, one of the wonderful things that happens if you do have a successful business model is that people will come quickly. So the cloning could actually work if you succeed in making this work. So maybe we'll, we'll start and um, I know Jim, you have a few more comments on that. So why don't we, Jim, go back to you to elaborate on some of the other things that can be done, bringing in additional players, how do you put together the public and the private sector in a public-private partnership, et cetera. And then we'll ask Christiana and Conde and Ricardo to comment on that as well. I think as you move toward that category of the underserved, which is really, in, you know, they might have access eight hours a day and they need access 24 hours a day, Histor generally it's in uh, urban areas, around urban areas. That's where you can bring equity to that and debt to that to support the um, state-owned utility in most cases. But that requires working out an arrangement to make that economically viable. So that's one approach. The fundamentally different approach in the remote areas and quite frankly, nobody has really mined all the work that's been done by these groups that are out there now. So their lessons learned from the experiences need to be brought together, and then we need to kind of roll it out in a way that works. So I think, and, and I'll give you one quick example, and then I'll stop. We did a small project in, in Patagonia in a small village 
but it was a village that housed a school where kids came from all the remote areas, they lived there three weeks, they went home for a week, they only had electricity four hours a day from a diesel, um, and a diesel generator. So we built a very small, on this very small stream, a 75 kW micro hydro. We worked with a utility in the province, they connected it, we put a wind turbine in, and at the end of the day, we were able to cobble that together and produce electricity 24-7. And that is a great, as people like to say, a great bang for the buck, because at the end of the day, the education of the, and with 24-hour access to electricity and computers, you've really accelerated the learning process for, for this group of people in a very remote area. So I, I think that that was one example, but there are many examples from other people that have done things. We just need to learn from them and advance the thinking. We will find the dollars. Christiana, we, uh, I'd welcome your point of view. And, and one of the things we haven't talked at all about is uh, carbon credits and the CDM mechanism and other mechanisms. Can that work with the kind of projects that Jim is talking about and be part of a public-private partnership? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, anything, basically anything that displaces what would have been or what is uh, greenhouse gas emissions can certainly, uh, almost everything, because there's more than 100 methodologies, could go into the CDM, uh, which is only one of the financial uh, mechanisms that is out there. And as we know, there are uh, many other financial mechanisms that are being uh, developed and that in the end will have to be combined. Uh, I think one of the big lessons learned on finance here is that there is no longer one such thing as a simple financial tool that will help to solve this. I think we will have to combine different um, financial um, financial instruments to be able to uh, to solve. And I'm I'm thinking right now of a fascinating project that I saw. Um, in Kenya, a very, very small microgrid for a village of 100, um, 100 homes that um, had the grid installed, a little, little grid installed, had the solar panels installed, all of this computer-based, sending the information of the both of the generation and of the use of energy via computer to the hub in California that then uh, in the hub in California, they could tell exactly who was using how much energy and how much of that energy was paid for because the users were paying for that energy via their mobile phone. And the moment they got to the certain minimum that they had paid for, they got a little message on their mobile phone, you need to replenish your electricity bill because otherwise you were gonna be disconnected. If they replenished, they stayed on the, on the grid, and if not, they were cut off. All of this from California. Uh, Having said all of that, the grid was financed through crowdsourcing, okay? Uh, and they, it went out on a crowdsourcing website and they got all the money that they needed in four hours to build this mini grid. So all of this, you know, just to say the fact is that what is possible, uh, we're, not even ex we're not even looking at what is possible. There's limitless possibilities of both how you connect these people, in particular rural dis, uh, unelectrified um, communities, there's just limited possibilities of how to do it technically, financially, operationally, and that's the exciting part. The exciting part is we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what can be done. And again, we have to do it. And the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking, and we have to do it as fast as possible. Excellent, excellent points. Uh, I love the crowdsourcing point, and I think, Jim, you ought to be starting a crowdsourcing exercise as part of your initiative. Gandhi, go ahead and... Uh, I'm actually I... crowdsourcing here. Okay. <laughs> For me, one of the key takeaways I got from one of the finance sessions today is the following. You know, sometimes, we, of course, you've heard it here, we need the long-term policies, we need to think long-term, and one private sector guy said yesterday, whenever you say 2030, I split it into quarters already, because that's what I use for my reporting. But one thing I learned today from uh, Rowan Douglas, 
He gave a nice story of how they as insurers and investors had to learn 17 years ago how to deal with risks that occur once every 50 years. Because Sandy does not occur every year. It takes time, but when it hits, it affects your business. So he said 17 years ago, we had to learn with science bringing, he said we need, he said we need the primary colors, the relationship between science, capital, and policy. He said that's what we had to do to develop new financial instruments to deal with risks that occur once in a blue moon because we didn't know them. But guess what? We make big bucks. And he showed, he said 17 years, we move 50 billion. So he said we need to align the same probably when we're looking at long-term financing for new energy technologies. We don't know yet in the finance world. So my point is the learning is not only on the technology side, the hardware, or the public policy side. Finance for long-term energy transformation, whether for climate or for access or deployment of new technologies, they need to also learn to think different because they did it for disaster insurance. Probably they can do it for energy investment that will pay off maybe in 20 years or save them more climate disasters. Good, let's turn to Ricardo. And Ricardo, if, if, if in the course of your comments you might also um, comment on what sorts of international investment instruments are there that we ought to be, international investment agreements and instruments that actually could help to facilitate the type of clean energy investments we've been talking about. Well, uh, thank you, Tim. I think I'm, I'm going to be um, hard-headed and go back to the importance of enabling regulatory frameworks at the international level. So if you're an investor, and, and Jane probably knows this well, um, particularly in the energy or infrastructure sector, you need certainty and you need predictability. You need rules that give you the confidence to really put your money where you need it, where you need to put it. Um, in the case of renewable energy projects, you have upfront costs that are very important, um, very steep, but then you have to, uh, to be able to get a return over very long periods right, on those upfront costs, at least 10 or 20 years. Um, I, I, I was just talking to someone who is developing projects on renewable energy in Africa, for instance, and he's telling me that um, he was able to get a guarantee uh, from an Exim bank uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in, in, in Germany specifically, uh, that would uh, make a con as a condition that the equipment is repurchased by the provider of the equipment 20 years after it has been installed. And he said, I'm happy to do that because the equipment is actually manufactured for a 30-year life and the investment is, so he's getting actually his equipment back for free, right? And so he's going to end up actually building his own assets as a product developer because he's, he has to get his equipment back now. But, but that's the absurd on how these things actually work across purposes. Or, uh, so, so again, you need, you need certainty in the regulatory frameworks. You ask about regulatory frameworks on investment, the situation on that is more complicated than on trade. We have about 3,000 bilateral investment treaties today in place in the world, which makes it absolutely crazy for any investor operating in a global market to really understand uh, which are the rules that, that he is following. Uh, most of these bilateral investment treaties have been signed by developing countries with everybody. There's a proliferation of, on, of this of this investment treaty, and we need and, and they are not necessarily all consistent. We also have investment uh, provisions in regional trade agreements and in the multilateral trade agreements as well that affect this kind of uh, of investments. So we need to do something there, and we need to do something specifically for energy. I go back to my previous um, uh, suggestion, which is that we act with specificity of purpose here. Same back to trade. We have that the, the way to de-risk really the investments is to make sure that rules that are related not only to to the efficiencies in access and so on, but to policies related to subsidies, related to the use of uh, trade remedies, to government procurement, to standards in the equipment and so on, are clear and are universalized, and they are not. And so we need to make sure that we also act on this in order to get the, the scale up uh, on investment. I'm going to give you an example again of how this works um, in, in a very perverse manner today. The, the Europeans have made uh, a decision to go for 20% of the, 
of shared of renewable energy in their energy mix by 2020, that 2020, 20. But this year, they decided to impose punitive duties and indeed something more perverse than that, which is it's an arrangement of, of export quotas um, on, on the solar equipment coming from China. That's going to affect somewhere between 11 to $20 billion of trade. It's about 75% of the total value of, of uh, uh, goods under remedies in Europe. And that's actually the case for most uh, countries using trade remedies today. They are focusing on renewable energies. Um, it's going to leave out of business a great number of about 800 European uh, companies that were working on solar uh, energy uh, through installations, project development, services, maintenance, etc. Uh, and it's going to compromise that the, the goal of the 20 by 2020. And why do they do this? Because again, trade policy is acting completely in, um, in, in uncoordinated manners from climate or energy policies. So my, my response to investment, again, is bring certainty and predictability by bringing clarity on those uh, regulatory frameworks at the international level. Ricardo, thank you very much. Thank you for all the panelists for great comments there. Um, let's open it now to questions from the floor. I think I see one hand already, and I hope we have microphones to bring the microphone to the, to the individual right back here in about the third row. And please identify yourself, please identify yourself and then ask your question. Hello, yes. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Yusuf al I'm from Saudi Arabia, and I'm, from, I'm an intern at the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, my question is on the clean energy without borders. We always uh, under, uh, investigate or, and focus on renewable energy to enable wider energy access. However, the, under the clean development mechanism, energy storage in the form of batteries or hydrogen is less investigated. And I would like to find out how policymakers would consider that and would they uh, uh, pay more attention into the uh, potential of energy storage and enabling wider energy access even with lack of resources in developing countries. Thank you. Excellent. Christiana, I think that one would be best for you to start. I actually don't think um, that uh, storage, uh, the, the capacity to increase our technical ability on storage depends on the clean development mechanism. I, I think that's putting the cart before the horse. Uh, it clearly is the Achilles heel of, uh, of uh, being able to harness the huge potential that we have on uh, renewable energy, not just for distributed, but rather for grid-connected uh, renewables. It truly is how do we continue to invest in what is already an incipient progress on storage capacity, but is nowhere near where we need to be uh, if we want to use renewables as a very uh, as a very fundamental substitute uh, for for traditional uh, fossil fuels. So I wouldn't link it to the clean development mechanism that can come later or any other financial mechanism. I would link it to uh, much more research and development that needs to go into storage. Jim. I, I would just quickly add, we're much further down the road on the development of storage. Our company alone has seven different pilots using different technologies, and actually we're using a 36 megawatt storage unit in one of our wind farms. So I believe it's coming, um, and, and this development is emerging, and I think it will play a critical role in the future. And I think the amount of research that's going into it, the amount of um, innovation that's being developed and how to integrate it into a grid or integrate it with solar and wind is terrific. And I think it, it, it's going to be there for us over the next five to 10 years. Uh, Conde or Ricardo, would you know? Another question right here. Okay. You hear me? Not very well. Is it? 
Is it on? Yes, please. And please identify yourself. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Amin Benouna. I'm from Morocco. Uh, presently uh, managing uh, uh, um, an independent consulting company on energy. And uh, I've been managing nine years a company collecting $6 a month on for rural electrification matters. I was just wondering about an advice given by Mr. Jim Rogers. Uh, don't you, aren't you afraid by your advice to the private to have the blessings of the utilities? Aren't you afraid that you are pushing them to push the utility people to confess that they have been unsuccessful in something that the private is coming to propose to, to them. Okay, so I'd, so I'd like to ask Jim and Conde to respond to this. I think it's a, it's a blessing very difficult to get from my own experience. <laughs> I, I, your point is a good one, but I think it's how you tell the story. And that is, they've had limited resources. They've had limited capability and quite frankly, the idea of building several thousand mile transmission lines to move power into remote areas doesn't make economic sense, and it hadn't in the past. So the, at the end of the day, it's really sharing with them the notion that we want to work together. We want to accelerate access to electricity in the country. And, and we want to do this together because, quite frankly, anybody that runs a company that provides electricity has a, knows that they have a very noble purpose. And anybody that can help them fulfill their purpose, they should embrace. I don't know how to answer that, but I will fudge it a little bit. Uh, I know for sure, based on what I have heard from utilities and some countries, utilities also have some learning to do. Uh, I have heard from some of those who are promoting off-grid solutions that some utilities are not ready yet for that new uh, uh, business model. Um, and so there's some learning there. As we look at more IPPs, but maybe small-scale interventions in the one megawatt range, utilities have to learn. Second. And this, some of this learning is taking place because I know that in the U.S., I also know in Italy, uh, some utilities are beginning to learn also to help consumers save on energy use. So, in fact, some utilities are beginning to distribute smart metering. Now, before the business model is do as much as you can to sell more. So, even utilities in the current, not only in the current business climate, utilities have to show... Uh, 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 what somebody calls persistent flexibility, as oxymoron as that sounds. In other words, they are persistent in the drive for energy accents, but a lot of flexibility to need to uh, adapt to these new disruptions as they were, especially disruptions coming out from a drive for more distributive power. So I forged it a little bit, and to do that, of course, they need to be open-minded, they need some more support from governments, and of course, Le, uh, le, uh, regulation helps. Ivo Dibor said yesterday companies respond to three things on sustainability, so climate people should learn. One, will sustainability help me introduce a new prof product that will make me profitable? Second, will it also help my business save on energy and water use so it helps my cost structure? But third, he said, will it affect my license to operate? So regulation matters in changing some behavior or helping. Utilities also begin to look at renewables as an option. Let's go to the center back here. Yeah, there you, there you go. Is it okay? Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Habib Nuhu from Nigeria, a PhD student at Southern National University. Uh, my question is going on uh, clean energy without borders, and it's going to the whole panel, and hopefully I hope to respond to that. Of course, energy access solely rely on affordability, and we are seeing that the potential to move the about 1.2 billion people that are in the bottom of the pyramid 
to the energy access framework is pretty much a daunting challenge for the world. But then we know that innovation, targeting those uh, bottom of the pyramid is a classical process or platform by which we can deliver our goal. However, we have seen less innovative energy solutions that are specifically targeting the bottom of the pyramid. So, what concerted effort from the private sector perspective, from the international organization point of view, what do you think we need to do so that we can specifically get private investments, we can get innovative companies to double up solutions that are specifically geared towards increasing access, access to energy, uh, access of energy at the bottom of the pyramid. Thank you. Who would like to take the lead on this one? I'll do it quickly by simply okay. saying. <laughs> and then Kandi has, has a comment as well. I, I think quickly, First of all, you have to think in terms of new financing models, the innovation that comes with new technology. And one thing that I've left out is really the education of the people who use the energy, because not everybody thinks it's valuable for them. And equally important, you, it's a job creator within the community. And, and maybe part of the answer in a community is where there is a hospital, they build to supply electricity, or to build a hospital in an area. There's a variety of ways to, to do this, but it's gonna take a really a focus, and it's gonna take a certain stick to and innovation to make it happen. Just to say that in sustainable energy for all, in fact, we're trying to focus on that problem. So one of the things we've done right now over the last year and a half is build a database of about 1,500 NGOs and social entrepreneurs. And a number of those are not necessarily energy NGOs, but why did they choose energy? Because as they try to do food security work or health work, they realized they needed to provide energy. So we're building this database. We're trying to raise it up to two or 3,000 names, addresses of those who are operating at the bottom of the pyramid, but also to collect ideas on what we need to do exactly, what, how we respond to what you're saying. Uh, not easy. We know that replicability is very difficult. We know that getting fund, I mean, we, one of the cases, Jim, you mentioned at the Clayton Global Initiative, uh, one of the projects that he has sponsored in Uganda, the lady is doing well in distributing the solar lanterns. He's, she's done a few villages, but she can do maybe 20, 30 villages. But to move from five to 10 or 20, that's a scale she cannot handle on her own. Who will train the entrepreneurs that will be her distributors? These are real bottlenecks that we're trying to collect from these social entrepreneurs at the bottom of the pyramid to see how we can assist, either through public policy or, in fact, get that financing, that seed money to operate, so we can have millions of en simple energy solutions going to communities before we wait for the big ones. And we must do that because it takes, in some countries, three to five years to incubate a big energy project. In those five years, what do people do? Sit and wait in dark? So we need to address the point you were making. We can have simple solutions in communities or basic lighting or small off-grid solutions. And so we must pay attention, but very complicated. Good. Christiana. Yes, tomorrow being the uh, International Day of Rural Women, I can't help but uh, put a plug in here because uh, some of my very, very favorite projects in uh, rural electricity, just decentralized electric solutions, are precisely those that are using women as the entrepreneurs to distribute the solar lights, the solar panels, uh, because it has a double whammy benefit, right? It brings the solution to the homes where women and children are the most affected, but it also empowers empowers a certain subset of women to become entrepreneurs and takes them to the next level of economic, uh, of economic income, of, of financial income. So um, I think that particular combination of decentralized renewable energy and empowering training women to be the solution providers is actually, uh, in particular for Africa, where, where, which is the continent that is incubating these models, is a very, very exciting exercise and has to be taken to scale.
Excellent. And Ricardo? Just, just a, quick, um, a quick comment is that uh, I, I think also that it's, it's a question of working on the dissemination of the technologies that we already have, um, as well as, as um, in uh, incentivating uh, more R&D and particularly R&D networks that provide the, the innovation um, by focusing on distributive energy. I had a conversation with um, a woman energy minister from a Western African country who was um, basically manifesting her impatience because in the projects that she has, where most of the money goes, uh, they're trying to, to get universal access through the grid and they know that this would come in 2070 if they continue investing at the pace that they're investing today. Um, and I think that, that we have to go back to off-grid and distributive uh, energy solutions with much more focus. Uh, try to identify the technologies that are particularly good and they exist today for sort of middle uh, level solutions, middle scale solutions, to power 50,000 uh, uh, people villages or 20,000 people villages and, and those exist and put the, the resources there rather than uh, continue to develop grids at the pace that they're doing today in those countries that require um, that, that, that energy with the urgency that they do. Great, thank you very much. I wish we had time for more questions, but I think we have to give our panelists a, a final word. I'm, I'm afraid we, uh, we just don't have time for one more question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but I'm sure everybody here will be glad to stay and talk with those who want to come up and ask them questions at the end. Let, let's just, um, starting with Christiana, let's go down and ask each one of our panelists if there's, um, if there's one thing that you'd like the audience to think about coming out of this conversation about clean energy without borders, what's the one takeaway that you'd like to leave with them, the one action that the energy community should be working to try to achieve, and, and add any other closing remarks you might have? Well, thanks. Um, it, it strikes me that the conversation here at the uh, World Energy Congress is not about the quantity of energy that we're going to have in the future. It's about the quality of energy that we're going to have. And it is no exaggeration to say that the quality of the future energy is going to determine the quality of life on this planet. That is no exaggeration. And that being the case, I would say that there are three things that are going to determine the quality of energy and the quality of life on this planet. First, policy. Second, policy. And third, policy. And when I say that, I mean policy both at the national level and at the international level. If those two are vertically integrated, then we have the start of everything that we need. Then we have the priming the pump for technology, for finance, for regulatory, for attracting investment. But it is really, it stands or sinks with policy. I would start with the simple notion that we must have a can-do attitude about this problem and failure is really not an option. The inequality in the world is primarily driven by lack of access to electricity. And I think the way to think about it is simply this, and I'll use this word several times. We need innovation in how we finance. We need innovation in the deployment of technologies that are available today that weren't available in the past. We need innovation in the models that we use to bring electricity to these remote areas. We need to demonstrate, replicate, and scale and lastly, we need innovation in country policies. That combination of innovations will make a difference and allow us to bring electricity to those without access. Kande. I will just ask you to join me in pushing for a dedicated goal for energy in the new development agenda that we're negotiating at the, at, the, at the UN over the next year and a half. 
if energy is not listed as a priority, it will not be a priority in countries or investors. When Millennium Development Goals were defined, everything on that list, those eight, people treated as important. Energy sits right at the middle of the two biggest challenges we face. One, how do we ensure prosperity for all? When we are 8 billion and when we are 9 billion. Jobs, economic prosperity, social welfare. Second, how do we deal with climate change? You can't solve these two without dealing with energy access or better use of energy. So it is in your vested interest, my vested interest, that we insist that if we do believe energy is serious, it must be a dedicated goal. But you need to help me convince your ministers, foreign ministers, and others when they go to New York, they believe what you say. Make it a goal, and then the public policy will follow. Thank you very much. And Ricardo. Uh, thank you, Tim. I think um, what I've been saying is really the message I'd like to leave with the, with the public here, which is that we need a dedicated effort, one about coherence in policy at the national and at the international level. And I know that asking for coherence from policy is it's, uh, difficult. But we need the focus on renewable energies to lead to the kind of policies different than traditional energy policies that would uh, allow us to really enable functioning, robust, efficient markets at the global level that deliver the innovation products as well as the technologies that we need for mitigation, access, as well as security. And that requires, again, putting together energy, climate, trade, and negotiating and crafting a specific arrangements at the international level that deal with the kind of inefficiencies and barriers that we have today. Excellent. Well, I hope that all of you have enjoyed this conversation. Um, I think the, the range of, of different issues is great when you think about the, the world of clean energy without borders, and yet you can see a coherence to the entire picture, a coherence that involves a solid regulatory and policy basis that sets the bound, sets the, the game work, the game plan for where investment needs to take place. A, a world in which you get rid of unnecessary costs uh, and through the re reduction and elimination of trade barriers. A world in which there's innovation in ideas for how you create investment models. And a world in which there's a real commitment to continuing to work cooperatively across all the different boundaries that exist. Please join me in thanking our fantastic panel for sharing thoughts with us that I hope we will all take away and, and work on in the future and, um, and that help us to become better at what we do. Thank you very much, panelists.